All right, so now we're starting a new increment. We're going to call this one Integration Battle. I've sort of touched on it, of course, in different ways, but not from the standpoint of an official battling. So we're going to do that starting here. The integration battle is really your entire life, no matter what kind of life you're talking about. It is always an integration battle. There is something apart that you want to bring closer. There is something close you want to push apart. That's a battle. That's really a battle of integration. The whole idea of relationship to God is to get close to God. And that's an integration. So close is integrated and far away is disintegrated. Your whole life is essentially disintegrated from God. And the trick is to get it to be closer and integrated with God. The same is true for everything in your life. There's stuff in your life that you're trying to get rid of, and there's stuff in your life that you're trying to get closer to. There are procedures, sequences, stuff you do, taking a shower, the process of taking a shower, step one, step two, step three, step four, and you've done it so often, it's actually integrated into your routine, and you don't even think about the fact that you're doing step one, step two, step three, step four. But when you first start out something, and you're trying to, like, get it efficient, then you actually spend time thinking, okay, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? But once it's integrated, you don't think about that anymore. Brushing your teeth is an integrated part of your life. You, you, you think about what you're going to do today while you brush your teeth. Washing your hair, pretty much the same thing. You pay very little attention to what's integrated into your life because it is integrated into your life. So a lot of it can just lie as a word go on road or habit. And that's the problem we have with the spiritual life. We, in a way, are too well familiar with Scripture. The whole God thing is, you know, very much a part of our, our culture and society, especially in the West. But, you know, the Muslims have their version and everybody has their version. That doesn't mean all versions are the same or all versions are alike or all versions are right. But it does mean that it's common. There is a common idea of God, right, wrong, or indifferent, in every culture. And that's the problem. Once it's that familiar, once it's that integrated into society, everybody forgets. Which is what you do with your brushing your teeth. See, what's good about a thing is also the exact same item is what's bad about it. Now, in the case of God, the problem is that we're so used to the words and we're so used to the people talking that how do I want to put this? There is a certain idea of you're accepted if, you're not accepted if. Integration and acceptance go hand in hand. If the idea of God, one particular idea of God is integrated into society, a competing idea of God is not. And therefore, essentially the initial reaction of anybody in that society is to reject it. So if you're in a Muslim society, you're going to reject the Christian or Jewish ideas of God because the accepted one is the Muslim idea and vice versa. Okay. This is irrespective of whether or not, you know, whatever is the truth. People really don't care about the truth. They care about what's accepted. Okay, this is the shameful thing about being human, is that we go by whether we like the person giving out the information, not, we don't care about the information itself. 
We tell ourselves we do, but it's not true. Because if it were true, for example, that Bible mattered to believers, then it wouldn't matter who said it. But it does matter. People will literally cut off. Well, I'm not listening to that person because yada yada. Yeah, but you don't know what that person's saying. He still might say something correct about Bible. There might be something about Bible that's correct that God gave him to say. And he might be wrong in the other areas, but he's not wrong in all of them. But oh, no, I'm not going to listen. You know, that person's Catholic. I'm never going to listen to them. How do you know that, that God doesn't give him some things to say? Okay, you don't. So that's why you can't just cut off somebody because their denomination is heretical. Or because they're not dear doctor so-and-so. Or because they don't have degrees. Some of the best, um, most insightful um, scriptural stuff comes from people who don't have respectability. Okay? And God has done that through history. He tells you in the Bible. He shows you. He uses what? The prophets. And some of the prophets did some really, you know, what do you want to call it? Egregiously ugly things. Okay? Like Elijah was dirty. Ezekiel had to lay on his side to mimic the siege. So he wasn't, you know... He had to use, I, I want to say, was it him or somebody else? God told him to use human feces, which was unclean under the law, in order to cook your food. Okay? That's really gross to anybody. But in the ancient world, that's what they did. They collected human and animal feces and used it for, for cooking food. I can't even imagine the smell. I mean, maybe there was a way to, you know, get rid of the smell. I don't know. I, I just, the, the smells of the ancient world, I can't even begin to, to tolerate. Okay? So that kind of stuff, you know, God uses politically unresp... How do you want to call it? Politically incorrect people to transmit his word. Then and now. Now, I'm saying this because, see, the battle of integration is that you got people who are, you know, all of us are in a society, and to that extent, we're somewhat integrated, but by what? What is the integrator in our society? Our common culture, our common past, our common language, our common customs, okay? And... Anything that's outside of those or anything that is deemed to be opposite or enemy to those, we will, by instinct, because we're integrated, push them away. And one of the common integrators, customs, culture, whatever you want to call it, is that, oh, somebody has to be respectable and important or popular or, you know, something in order for you to want to listen to what they say. And that means that what they say is of less importance than the one who's talking. And I've had this argument with a lot of people. You know, they say, well, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so says, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so says. And I'm like, yeah, but what so-and-so said, the content of it is stupid. So why do you... Well, but so-and-so is respectable. It doesn't matter what they said is stupid. The content is dumb. It's not right. It's wrong. It's factually wrong. Oh, but they're respectable. It doesn't matter that it's factually or some other way wrong. But, see, people are so uninterested in what the truth is they're uninterested in thinking they're uninterested in as it were forging an integration or disgorging an integration that they just go by what's 
popular. It's a really big problem in society. This is why there this whole integration process, which is hard enough as it is because God's God and you're human, is made much more difficult because you're in a milieu, you're in a culture that is basically against God, no matter how much it touts him. And which is against the truth. So you are really swimming upstream. You're swimming against your own nature and you're swimming against your culture and the, everything around you to even want God. Because how do you want God if you don't want the truth? I mean, God is God. That's a fact. That's a truth. And you're going to have to search. Even if you, know, even if you have the Bible, you're still going to have to search. Because all the interpretations that are out there of the Bible, for the most part, are, are either at least partly wrong, egregiously wrong. And, you know, then you got the mistranslations, which is practically every verse. So this is the battle for integrating with God is the highest, hardest, longest, most thankless battle you can get into. And you can tell it really quickly because how easily can you have a comfortable conversation with somebody about beliefs about God? Truly comfortable. Like, do you believe in God? Somebody you know at work, for example. How do you get to a place where you can even talk about this? And obviously you're not going to talk about it at work. That would be an abuse. But, you know, I mean, maybe you're in the elevator or maybe you're at a party or something. How do you even get to the subject without, and here's the, here's the kicker to prove the point that I've been making. The minute you bring up this kind of thing in a conversation, even among friends, even among people you know you, there's a gut reaction, both in you and in them, to sort of brace for battle. Okay? To sort of brace for, oh, this person's going to try to sell me his version of God. Why do we think that? How is it that we can have conversations about windows or TV programs or clothing and it isn't interpreted immediately as a sales conversation. But boy, oh boy, the minute the topic becomes God, you have to brace yourself because somebody who's going to say their idea of God is going to try and sell it to you. Why do we even think that? See what I mean? It's a battle because the culture, and it's pretty much universal on this one topic, Universally, the culture pretty much is that, oh, if you talk about God, that means that one person in the conversation is going to try to sell the other person in the conversation to have a particular idea or belief in God. Try to convert them. Why? I don't have any interest in converting anybody. I don't talk about God in real life. It's come up on occasion. It's always been really weird when it has. But you don't talk about it because somehow that's going to get you into a Donnybrook. Okay? And you can be in China, you can be in Russia, you can be in Germany, anywhere. And there are some, some cultures where they prefer t to argue about the whole God thing. That's the way it was in, like, New Rome, a.k.a. Constantinople, now called Istanbul. They, there was this joke, this running joke, that if you were getting your shoes sign, shined, the guy shining your shoes wanted to argue about whether or not the, Jesus was in the hypostatic union. In other words, whether or not he was God-man, or whether he was just God, or whether he was just man. And, and that it was a, a topic of argument in daily life. And I'm sure that there are some places in the world where that's true. 
okay, at some times in, on Earth. But they're rare. And even then, it's still pitched as an arguing. You know? So, the God thing, everything in life is a battle for integration one way or another. There's just no getting around that. Everything you do, everything you, you try, everything you're used to is an integrated thing. Everything you're not used to is a non-integrated thing. And you're always battling between taking something that's integrated and getting rid of it or taking something that's not integrated and getting it integrated. That's true in your whole life from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep. But... When it comes to the God question, it's a battle not only against your soul, because he's God and you're not, clash of natures, okay? And it's at your end that the battle is occurring. He's not battling you. You're battling him, just because you're human. But it's also a battle with your other fellow humans. This is like, this is, you know, in polite society, you grow up, Realizing that you never discuss politics or religion at the dinner table. In polite society, you talk about really stupid things like the weather or your next garden project. Or Oh, golly. I absolutely hate formal dinners. Okay? And the same thing is true for your cocktail parties and all the rest of it. Small talk. Anything that isn't divisive. And the two things that are considered divisive are religion, really God, and politics. Human race subjects God inside the mantle of religion, which right there is a disintegrating thing. Why do we link God underneath religion? God and religion don't have anything to do with each other. God and politics don't have anything to do with each other. But we're forever trying to integrate God underneath our thumb. So that's another battle. Not only is it a battle to talk about God at all, but once you get into the area, the battle is to get God away from what humans want to put him into. They're trying to integrate God underneath religion, underneath politics. That's why pro-life is so vile. It's trying to religify politics. And it's trying to do that in the name of God. And it's trying to stick God underneath their insisted idea of what's good or right or true. And they don't give a flip. At all. They don't care. That the Bible disagrees with them. It's it's a phenomenon of just well, it illustrates this whole point I'm trying to make. Because I've gone in other articles, you know, I've been around YouTube and in Breitbart News where they've been, you know, Ted Cruz is campaigning for president, blah blah blah, and I I say every time he if he claims to be a good lawyer, how come he doesn't know the law in Exodus twenty one twenty two, which says flat in the Hebrew, fetus is not a legal person, therefore it's not murder. Okay, he should know that. I know that. I can look it up in the Hebrew. I can look it up in the Greek. I can look it up in the Catholic Latin. And it says that if there's a miscarriage, a woman gets hit by somebody and she miscarries as a result, which is tantamount to saying she has an abortion because somebody hurt her. It, it's not murder. It only depends on what damage is done to her. Not to the fetus. If the fetus falls out is the way that language goes in the verse. Okay, how come Ted Cruz doesn't know that? Pro-lifers stick the Bible underneath their ideas and then they won't look at it. This is a classical illustration of how the truth that's really blunt... It's blunt in the Hebrew. It's blunt in the Greek. It's blunt in the Latin. It's blunt in eight English 
translations, some of which go all the way back. Well, yeah. The earliest translation in English that says what I've just told you is in the Douay Reims, which is a Catholic Bible of 1610. 1610. That's 400 years ago. 500 years ago. 400. Okay, so that translation has been out and used for 400 years by Catholics. You know, they're the ones who are real big on don't get abortion. But they never made it a law. Okay? Now, the point I'm trying to make is truth in this example is blatant. You even got the respectability supporting it. You know, the Latin, Catholic, Vulgate translation using abortivum, which was where we get the English word abortion. Okay, you got eight English translations which have been out for 400 years or less. And they're all respectable by translation committees. So how can we disregard that? People don't want the truth. Here we're talking about pro-life first, sticking God underneath religion, underneath politics. Religion is God instead, politics is God instead, and God is just this person whose name we use to slap on all the positions we want supported. That's the battle of integration. They want to integrate God underneath their thumb. And it really shows there. So when you're thinking of the battle of integration, it's a daily battle you go through all the time. It is an especial battle that you go through with respect to God, being even able to talk about God. And then fourth, it's a battle where everybody shoves God underneath a human institution. Religion politics. Religion is a human institution. It's not a God institution. Religion is a human institution where humans make up all kinds of goofball ideas about how they can uh, merit something before God. That's religion. It's basically politics applied to God. That's why it's like politics. That's why religion and politics are all, often mixed. Politics is men fighting with other men over what position ought to govern. It's ridiculous. That kind of integration in the world is totally inimical to the spiritual life. So the battle of integration is, is monstrous, actually. The hardest thing you'll ever do is get something about God in your head. And trying to live it out once it's in your head, guess what? It almost never works. I know so much about him now, it's not funny. But can I play it out? Can I walk the walk instead of just talk the talk? No. So then the question becomes, well, what's the role then of walking the walk? And that'll have to be, I mean, basically the answer, you know, for a taste of coming attractions, the answer is basically you just keep practicing it anyway. You can't tell that it's actually working because it's spiritual. And basically what you're doing is Matthew 4, 4 always occurring. You're integrating, inserting, integrating, a.k.a. inserting, into your physical life to some Bible that you're thinking of at the time. And it doesn't seem to have any effect. It's never going to. And the second thing it doesn't seem to do, it doesn't seem to improve your, what do you want to call it, behavior. It doesn't make you a better person. It's not that kind of integration. The battle of integration is to stick the Bible into your life while you first to know it and then to do it. 
but when you do it, that doesn't it doesn't seem like it does anything. Hi, I'm thinking of Samson and Delilah while I wash the dishes. H how is that doing anything? to, as it were, improve the integration or improve your life. It doesn't seem like it works. But you just keep on doing it because it's better than just washing the dishes and thinking about something else. So how, how does this play? Well, it seems to not work. That's how it plays. So the part of the battle of integration, the fifth thing, is that, okay, I'm battling, I'm battling, I'm battling, I'm learning and living on Bible, I'm washing dishes, I'm doing the laundry, I'm going to the opera, I'm buying my 16th Maserati, I'm living and learning on Bible while I do that. And that's all there is. It doesn't seem like any integration occurs, ever. It's what it is, and your body is what your body is, and your body can't retain it. Your body's not going to improve. Your, you know, your, yourself is not going to improve. If you're doing this for self-improvement, just stop. Because that's not what it's about. It's just about learning God and knowing God. So the integration battle there for this, this fifth thing is it never seems to work. It never seems to integrate, even when you're doing it. Now, before you get all depressed about that, here's the sixth thing. It's the exact same mechanism as the cross. Let me repeat that. This integration battle that doesn't ever seem to work is the exact same mechanism as the cross. That's what happened on the cross. Our sins lacerated him. Wahu mecholal mepshenu. Wahu and he mecholal was javelin stabbed mepshenu with our sins. Rebelling sins in particular. Pesha means rebelling. Wahu and he, Meholal, was javelin stabbed, Mepeshenu, with our rebelling sins. Now think about that. It hurts to think about it, but try. Stabbing. You've seen enough movies so you know what that looks like. If you've ever been stabbed, you know what that feels like. Stab, 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 stab. There's a lot of shame in it. There's a lot of, why are you doing this? There's a lot of bewilderment. There's a lot of, why isn't God helping me? And of course, there's a lot of pain. But it's mostly psychological with stabbing. It's mostly the, why is this happening? Why is this person, because it's a violent act and you're seeing the person doing it to you. Not just the stabbing action, hitting your skin. You're seeing the person doing it to you. So it's very personal. It's very intimate. And it's very bewildering. Stab, 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 stab. And, and and it's very meaningless. Because it's like, what? Why? And there's no answer to that. It's just stab, 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 stab. See, there's no integration there. If anything, you could say it's separating. It's trying to separate parts of your body from you. I'm trying to separate you from life. And that's all. That's all it is. There is no grand purpose. There is no special value. There is no wonderful, you know, blessing. It just hurts. It's just weird. It's just awful. And it's just meaningless. Stab, stab, stab. That's a battle, obviously. That's where stabbing occurs. 
and it's it's got no no it accomplishes nothing and that's exactly the wording that the Bible uses for this. Daniel 9.26 He will be cut off accomplishing nothing. Meaning the cross. Isaiah 53.11 explains what's really happening. And yes, Isaiah 53.5 was Wahu mecholal mepshenu and he Wahu Meholal was javelin stabbed Mepeshenu with our rebelling sins. Isaiah fifty three eleven though tells what he was doing in his head with the doctor while he was being stabbed. So on the left you got Wahu Meholal Mepeshenu. On the right Meamal Lapsha Yere. Who is Paul? That's Isaiah 53:11. In his head, by by his by means of his soul pregnancy labor. And by means of his truth knowledge, that's also in the soul. He makes righteous. He will see. He is ba. He will be satisfied. What I want to and our sins are twisting sins. Who is ball? He carried. Who means he in Hebrew. Okay? There you go. So he's getting stabbed. That's the action. That's the battle. And he is responding in his soul to the stabbing with awareness of what it means. And so his soul, as you know, you'll hear Paul explain it in the book of Hebrews, explain it. His soul got bigger. But it was what he did with his soul that integrated it integrated the meaning the actual stabbing didn't do anything didn't accomplish anything didn't benefit him didn't do nothing all it did was hurt and stab but what he did in his soul with it integrated it okay so the battle of integration is twofold one the external whatever it is is stabbing you Okay? And the second thing, which is the key, is internally in your soul, you're using Bible doctrine to, as it were, respond, reply, adjust to the stabbing. Now, that kind of thought pattern, that kind of reaction, is not human. It requires a lot of doctrine before you're able to do that. And even when you do that, notice the thing that stabbed you, that's all it did was stab you. You're washing the dishes, that's all you're doing is washing the dishes. Your brain is thinking about Bible class, but your body is just washing dishes. Your body is not benefiting from your brain thinking about Bible class. Your body's just as dead to Bible. Your body's just as dead to God. Your Bible, your body's just as dead to doctrine as it was before you started doing the dishes and thinking about your Bible class. But your soul got bigger. Your soul basically leveraged doing the dishes like Christ leveraged the stabbing he got on the cross into an opportunity to think more Bible and thus get bigger. You see how paradigmal this is? Whether you're being stabbed or you're washing dishes, it's the same mechanism. Whatever you're doing with your body, put Bible on it. That's an insertion. That's an integration. But the thing you're inserting the Bible into, it is dead to God. It is dead to Bible. It is dead to the spiritual life because it is not spiritual. 
but the spiritual got still inserted in it by means of a spiritual process which the Holy Spirit runs in your soul. So where does the actual integration occur? In your soul. But you leveraged or used as a tool the dishes or a stabbing or whatever to create, as it were, the juridical reason for the process to occur. And then the beneficiary of that process is your soul. So notice, in the battle for integration, there's no change in the world. There's no change in your body. You're not a better person. Neither is anybody else better. But your soul is bigger. Every time you use Bible doctrine, your soul increases in size. If you're, you know, between sins. Otherwise, it's just hot air. So keep on using 1 John 1 9. Keep on using Bible doctrine on everything. Even if you use it wrong, you're trying to use it. Keep on talking to God. And that's the battle for integration. But what gets integrated is really your soul. Not the outside. Not the activities. I mean, there might be some, because the body, when it repeats, 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 gets to integrate. The body, when it repeats an action that got associated with Bible doctrine before, that Bible doctrine will come back to your mind again. But that's as far as it'll go. Getting a better world out of this, not going to happen. Getting to be a better person out of this, not going to happen. So the walk, the walk, the integrated walk, the spiritual walk, is that you're lear learning and living on Bible all the time. Not that you get it right, but that you go through the process. Because the world isn't doing that. And no matter how right they are, or how good they are, or how much they do, or how much their goods are, or how much their good deeds are, it's all doo doo. It's not integrated with God. They pushed him below religion, they pushed him below politics, that's where they want him, so they're not integrated with him. They're integrating their fake idea of God with them. And they've already, they're not even in the battle of integration. Or you can say they're casualties of the battle of integration. Or you can say that they've won the battle of integration for the wrong side. Think it over.